Welcome to Vivid Sydney. I am Yvonne Weldon, Wiradjuri Woman and Deputy Chairperson of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. I would like to pay my respects to our Elders past and present, to all First Nations, to you and the many ancestors of the lands you travelled from. The landscapes of this continent tell us the stories of our culture, our history and our boundaries. On behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, the Elders and the members, I welcome everyone to the land of the Gadigal. I acknowledge Gadigal people whose spirits and ancestors will always remain with this land, our Mother Earth. Here today, tomorrow and every day, let us be inclusive, kind and respectful wherever we venture. Enjoy Vivid Sydney. everybody and welcome to How to Grow Old and Try Not to Die. Uh, my name's Neil Jasingham. I'm a clinical associate professor with Sydney University, a psychiatrist and a human being. As a result, I am currently aging. Uh, that is a specialist word meaning living. So how do we do that? How do we grow old well and try not to die? Today we will hear from four experts in the field as well as um, me, uh, as we consider that question. After each talk, we'll be able to take a quick question from the audience. Uh, I'd ask you to raise your hand uh, and we'll invite you to speak. And we'll also try to have time at the end of, uh, for open questions to the panel. Uh, today's talk is being video recorded and will be available later from the Wisdom Connect website. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Paminda Sachdev is Sanchia Professor of Neuropsychiatry and co-director of the Center for Healthy Brain Aging at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, and clinical director of the Neuropsychiatric Institute at Prince of Wales Hospital. His major areas of research are cognitive aging and dementia. He has published over 800 peer-reviewed journal papers and six books, and was named New South Wales Scientist of the Year for Biomedical Sciences in 2010, and awarded the Ryman Prize for Contributions to Healthy Aging in 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Sachdev. Thank you, Neil, for the kind introduction, and good afternoon. I presume you're here because you're all interested in living a long and healthy life, and perhaps some of you an exceptionally long and healthy life. Uh, now, the question I'm going to ask, in fact, pose to you today is, can we live 250? And of course, would that be desirable? Now, let me begin by posing a few questions. If it were possible, through new medical breakthroughs, to extend your life to 150, would you opt for it? If you were told at the age of 20, that you're going to live to 150, would you live your life any differently? And if all humans were to live beyond 120, and some maybe even up to 150, would that be better for mankind? Now, I don't want you to answer these questions right away, but ponder over these as we go along uh, in this session and, of course, later. Now, we know that we are living 
longer lives uh, in the 21st century. But this is actually, uh, human longevity is actually a relatively recent phenomenon. If you look at this figure, uh, now going back to uh, say 1800, the average human lifespan was only about 32 years. And then fast forward 150 years to the mid 20th century, and we see that there has been a big significant change, but most of this change has happened in technologically advanced countries. And that early change was because there was a reduction in infant mortality. So overall lifespan at birth, this is what we're calculating at birth. That change occurred because of, uh, because we were saving babies. But in the last 70 years, or maybe 100 years, there has been a reduction in late life mortality. And as you can see, around the world now people are living longer. And the average lifespan is over 70 years. In some countries, including Australia, it's actually now in the mid 80s. And that's likely to go up into the 90s in the, by the middle of this century. Now, and if you actually look at, say, the plant and animal kingdom, you see examples of various kinds of lifespans. In fact, exceptional longevity is not uncommon in the plant kingdom. I mean, this is one example of a pine in the California forests, uh, in fact, in the United States. And this, this pine uh, is dated over to over 5,000 years. So it tells us that, yes, living organisms can have a very long lifespan. But is it restricted to plants? What about animals? We look at terrestrial animals. Uh, we see that most of these animals have a, a reasonable lifespan. Uh, which can vary from a day to maybe several decades. And there's some variation in their age in, for different animals. But there is a, some biology which restricts that age, uh, the maximum age that uh, most animals would uh, be able to live to. The variation occurs in the time of death occurs because of a number of other factors, including significant environmental factors. But there are some constraints that biology seems to have uh, posed. But there are some exceptions. If you look at some aquatic animals, uh, look at the coral reef, for example, or you look at some fish, they live exceptionally long lives. And then there is very, this very strange example of what has been called the immortal jellyfish. Now, this jellyfish grows into an adult, but then under times of stress, it can actually revert back to a pupa stage and then start its life all over again. So literally, it is immortal. Of course, it can be eaten by another fish and, or, or die from uh, other accidental causes and all. But otherwise, it, in, to some extent, is immortal. Now, what does it say? One lesson I guess biologists get from this is that within the system of multicellular organisms, there are mechanisms by which life can be preserved for a long period of time. Now, why it doesn't happen in humans or a number of other animals we've seen, uh, that's what biologists want to understand so that they can hack that process, maybe hack death. That's what really biologists would like to do. Of course, we know that uh, the, life, the rec world record for longevity is held by this woman, Madame Calme, who died in 1997 at the age of 122 years plus. But she's actually been the only woman documented, or only person documented to have lived beyond 120 years. But when we try to understand why we die, why we age and die, uh, one simple way of looking at it is that because the body is made of cells, each organ is made of cells, and there are meta metabolic processes happening in the body all the time, which actually try to damage these cells and destroy these cells. And of course, the body has repair mechanisms as well. And there is a balance between cellular repair and cellular death and damage. And as long as you can keep that balance going through your life, you, are, you remain healthy. However, as we age, as uh, chronologically, the, the balance seems to tilt a little towards more cellular damage. And that's why the organs become frail and eventually the system collapses. 
And there are many different processes. We have listed nine processes. We don't have time to actually discuss these today. In fact, this, these are the traditional nine processes. Now we've added five more. So there are 14 different biological processes scientists are studying to try to understand why this balance shifts towards more cellular death and uh, damage uh, from repair. And if we can actually try to understand them, perhaps we can intervene in some way and try to slow the aging process. Now, can we really hope to do that? Can we, are there examples that we can extend the lifespan of animals? So one very interesting example, this has been known for nearly 100 years, is that if you restrict calories in an animal, you can extend the lifespan of the animal. It's been shown convincingly in a number of uh, animals like worms and flies, even in mice, you can increase their lifespan by 30 to 50 years. Now, whether you can do that in humans or in primates, we don't conclusively know. But we know that caloric restriction improves your overall health, reduces obesity, diabetes, hypertension, reduces your risk for cancer, for cardiovascular disease. So it's good for you, in a way. But the thing, what biologists would like to do is understand how this happens. What is, this, what is the mechanism? Because if you know the mechanism, perhaps we can come up with a drug. So so that you can take the drug and not have to restrict your calories, which would be having your cake and eating it too, in a way. So there are a number of drugs that have been tried. You probably have heard of drugs like resveratrol, which is in red wine, or rapamycin. But none of these drugs actually has worked convincingly in trials. Uh, so at the moment, we are still searching. And in fact, uh, I've listed metformin here, in fact, we are currently doing a trial led by my colleague, Professor Samaras in St. Vincent's Hospital, to see whether we can use metformin, which is an anti-diabetes drug, uh, to slow progression of uh, brain frailty, so to speak. Or we could do what has been called regenerative medicine. Now, there are stem cells in the body. In each organ, there are stem cells, which basically are kind of ancient cells which divide, continue to divide, ability to divide. But as we age, our stem cell stock goes down. Now, can we replenish that stock? It is possible. It has been done in experimental models. Can we create new organs? And now, of course, there is bioprinting of new organs. You can replace an organ. That if you have a very frail heart, you could probably get a new heart. Or you can rejuvenate by other means. And one very interesting uh, approach has been to actually use young blood. And this is also an old model. Now, these two unfortunate mice were fused together so that they were sharing their circulation. One is an old mouse, and the other is a young mouse. And you find that after a few weeks, the, young, the old mouse actually starts looking young and, in fact, has young characteristics, whereas the unfortunate younger mouse is now older. There's been some change, some exchange of molecules between the two, two mice. Uh, and what scientists are trying to do is understand what these molecules might be. And perhaps those can be converted into drugs so that you don't have to get young blood. In fact, there are companies in the United States, actually, we can go and you can get, get young blood, and there are trials happening in Alzheimer's disease, young blood, of course. I'm not very hopeful that that will work for long, but certainly that is a path to rejuvenation as well. And there's another thing that scientists are trying to do. There are certain cells in the body which become senescent, like they become old and they stop multiplying, but they, they then cause trouble, in a way, to the body. They cause inflammation. But we can identify these cells, and you can actually now have strategies to remove these cells. And this has been done in mice, again, in, uh, to rejuvenate mice. Now, having said that, I mean, having looked at the fact that, yes, our lifespans, in general, on the average, have been increasing, having said that, yes, we can probably look at strategies to hack death, so to speak. Has, do we think that naturally lifespan will continue to increase beyond 120? The evidence seems to be that that hasn't been happening, even though the average lifespan has been increasing, but the maximum has not really been increasing. Over the last 70 or 100 years, there's no evidence. We look at super cent number of supercentenarians. These are people who live beyond 110. This has been relatively constant for, uh, over the time that we've been measuring it, really. So it won't happen naturally. So the question then, of course, we come back to, can we hope to live to 150? I think it could happen, but it has to be through technological breakthroughs. It won't happen naturally. 
Uh, and uh, some people believe that death cannot be hacked, but we have to wait and see. But we can reasonably hope to live to 100. And we have a great example here. We're going to hear from her uh, today as to how one could possibly live very well to 100. And of course, most of all, we live into our 90s, and we can hope to live uh, independently. And I'll end with these two quotations from the Bible. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. So very prescient in a way. And then, of course, this quote, also from the Bible, our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures, yet the best of them are both, but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. So question is, we live, would we want to live to 150 if they are trouble and sorrow? So, and I, I leave you to ponder that. Thank you very much. I acknowledge uh, some of my colleagues from the center where I work uh, who are here and they distributed some brochures. And if you want to hear more about healthy aging, you certainly uh, uh, can uh, become members of our newsletter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sashdev. We have time for a question from the audience. Uh, there was a question about with the possibility of raising the sound. <laughs> okay. All right. I might move forward then to. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, you can hear me now. All right. I was just wondering if there was any. Were there any questions from the audience? Oh. We do have a question up there. Yes, I'll, I'll try to project my voice. Um, <laughs> okay. And forgive me if you haven't seen these studies, but there's been an interesting report of reverse aging recently. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jeannie Walker. I, I'm, I don't have a medical background, so forgive me, I'm asking as a lay person. I read a recent report in the BBC Science Focus magazine about a new study into reverse aging by Duke University and Harvard, and it talked about how aging might be slowed down uh, uh, with trauma and um, with other events, sorry, BBC Science Focus magazine. They looked at both chrono chronological aging and how DNA has been altered by a chemical reaction called methylation, something to do with cells. Would you mind commenting on this? I'm very sorry if you haven't had the chance to read this. I'm not familiar with this study in particular, but, but what, they, what happens, of course, see with DNA is, as you know, DNA, uh, you, you're born with a certain uh, gene, string of genes, and that's uh, quite fixed. You don't change that. But, but the expression of those genes, and that's really how they uh, actually uh, sort of convert into signals and uh, proteins which form the body. That is dependent upon certain characteristics of the genes, and one of those is uh, the level of expression. And that expression is determined by methylation, one as one. There are, it's called epigenetics, really, rather than genetics. And that methylation can uh, be influenced by diet and uh, also by lifestyle. For example, smoking is a major factor in uh, actually influencing methylation. Uh, so it can be both good as well as bad. And good methylation could lead to uh, rejuvenation, definitely. Uh, and we could possibly do that. In animal models, one could possibly do that. Of course, in animal models, genetic manipulation has also occurred, and that can also prolong the life of animals. But uh, it's not likely that in humans we will ever do that. But certainly with epigenetics, if we can work on epigenetics, that is a possibility that we can... Uh, that will uh, that basically determines how uh, the the gene is translated into protein uh, in uh, into function. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so in the meantime, Professor Sachdev, it's uh, diet and exercise, yeah. 
Yes, and, and mental stimulation uh, uh, for the brain as well. Yeah. Right, OK. And social health. I think social... I can do that. Yeah, yeah that's okay. right. Um, right. Uh, well, I'd like now to invite Dr. Lisa Mitchell, uh, a medical doctor specializing in the care of older people. She will not be speaking, but rather she will be interviewing our next speaker, Ms. Patricia Segal. Mrs. Segal is a role model for aging well. At the age of 98, she still lives independently in her own home. She is an avid reader, designs and sews clothes, and has recently taken up painting. She enjoys close contact with a son and daughter, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, as well as an active social life. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Patricia Segal. Patricia, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Just near, nearly. That's good. We can hear each other. Um, Patricia, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel as you approach 99, the end of your first century? Well, I've been very lucky all my life. So I've never had anything to complain about. So I've had a, I've had a wonderful time. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, you've certainly, um, it's good that you can say that you've had a good life. Is there anything you're worried about as you get closer to 100? Well, uh, up to now, I haven't even noticed my age very much, but I, I, it's now starting to get slightly downhill. I'm a little bit more wobbly than I was, which annoys me because, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm used to doing everything myself and I can see that things are going to start changing. So that's a concern. But you've got a few strengths. Can you tell us about what your strengths are? My strengths? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I enjoy doing things. I read a lot. I travel quite a lot, unfortunately. Then my doctor told me he didn't want me to travel anymore. So. I took, I was a bit upset for a little while, but I realised I'd really been to so many places that I, I'm not really missing it too much anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, they say that social connection is really important for well-being and healthy ageing. Can you share with us how you've maintained social connection as you've grown older? Well, I've always found it easy to talk to people. I enjoy talking to my people. My daughter used to say I could talk to a lamppost. <laughs> so, you know, so I've got about 12 friends at least. And uh, I know this, I've made it. I used to go and visit them, but they now come and visit me. So I work out tw twice a week, I do get different different people to see me, and I do that like once a month for all my friends. And then the rest of the times I read a lot when I see my family, so I'm not really lonely or missing anything out on anything. That's so cool. Um, Patricia, I heard from you <laughs> that you <laughs> joined an art class in order to meet new people. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, well, my, my husband, my husband passed away, I decided I had to do something instead of just being around the house. So I, I joined an art class, which I hadn't actually done before, and I found everybody so nice, and the teacher was terrific, and I really enjoyed it so much. I was surprised that I could just do something like that. You know, I've got quite a lot of paintings in my house, a lot of them have gone to my children and grandchildren. Uh, so for about seven, the last seven years, I've gone to painting class once a week. And they have also met friends there. And then they come to me and we share lunch. We've got a lovely restaurant downstairs. Yeah. We share lunch and then they come upstairs to my place and have coffee and cake. That, that keeps amazing. me busy. That's so cool. So you've like learned a new skill and you've made friends all at the same time. Yes. You've been doing that for seven years. Can you just tell us how old were you when you started art classes? Uh, 90-ish, yeah. over 90. That's really yeah. cool. I've always been the, 
the oldest lady everywhere. <laughs> um, a lot of people really struggle to make friends. You came up with a really great strategy of asking your grandchildren if you could meet their grandmothers. Can you tell oh, us a bit told, about that? Who told you? <laughs> <laughs> well, so people, you don't have to get the 4A app to meet three strangers. You can just, uh, so yes. can you tell us how you did that? Well, that's, that's what started it off. So they, they got me in touch with about three people. The first lady was, no. No good. <laughs> and she rang me every five minutes and she wanted me to know where I was and what I was doing and she was going to do this and that. In, in the end, I just had to stop answering her. Yeah. <laughs> and the second lady was a really, really nice lady, but unfortunately, it turned out, she said, oh, I can't come and have lunch with you today. I've got to see the doctor. And then she found out she was quite ill and she actually passed away. But number three was terrific, <laughs> and we used to have a one she wished to come. She lived in Dover Heights, so it wasn't far away. She would ca catch the bus to my place, and we'd have lunch downstairs. We shared lunch, and then we came upstairs to my place. And that, that was quite a few years, but she's passed away since then too. I'm oh, sorry, Patricia. Mm. So it sounds like you ghosted the first one and then the other two became <laughs> yes. ghosts. So that's yes. the downside of friendship. And then, then I found out, just it just occurred to me recently, all my friends are at least 15 years younger than me. Well, I don't know what they call that in the uh, friendship <laughs> world, but it sounds like you're, uh, I don't know, doing quite well with your friend. Yes. Um, I haven't finished yet. <laughs> That's really cool. I think that that's really, really important. Is there any age that you would like to go back to? No, never. I've never wanted to go back. Why, why go back? I had good things when I was younger and I've still got good things now, so I didn't feel necessary to go back. Perfect. <laughs> that's so good. And not wanting to go back, what are you looking forward to? Now, that's a difficult question. <laughs> I can't, I can't honestly say I'm looking forward to getting older. Uh, I, I just, I don't want it to stop, but unfortunately it will. It's just starting to very slowly come, you know, little things turn up that I didn't have a problem with until now. But I, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to check what my grandchildren are doing at school and how they're doing. But I, you know, I, I can't think of anything that's going to get better. So I'm happy to be the way I am now. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Patricia. It's, it's such a, a pleasure. pleasure to talk to you. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand over to Neil now. So I'm just going to introduce Neil again. And he's written some notes. So Neil has already introduced himself. But some people came in a little bit late. So I'm just going to refresh everyone's memory. So I would like to introduce Associate Professor Neil Jayasingham, who is a psychiatrist in public and private practice. So if you do need a psychiatrist in Sydney, um, <laughs> I don't know what your waiting list is like. Uh, he is also a clinical academic at Sydney University and has an interest in ageing as he is an old age psychiatrist, but also because he's human. And he is apparently playing the long game and intends to age well himself, which sounds like a good idea. Uh, so thank you very much, Neil. Okay. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for your patronage today. Um, the proceeds from your tickets are going towards uh, Wisdom Connect, a charity focused on, a, on uh, helping uh, seniors to be able to con uh, connect with each other and with other generations in the dissemination of their wisdom. Uh, for more information, please have a look at the website. So, uh, today's talk, I shall be going into excruciating detail about theories of late life personality and psychosocial development with a special focus on societal factors and metaphysical epistemology, or how to grow old and to try not to die. And how to not die is, uh, is, an, is, it, is, it, is the good thing about it is that we kind of know how to do this already. In fact, we're wired into this. 
A study by uh, Dawes Edelman in 2019 was where they measured the electrical activity of people who were looking at images associated with death and images of their own faces as well as other faces. What they discovered is that the brain refused to connect the idea of death with their own faces. Death was basically associated with everyone else. So when, when we are faced with concepts of mortality, there's an automatic response to avoid anything about it, including avoid thinking about the idea that we may not uh, survive. And does it matter? It does when it comes to issues of ageism. Studies of ageism have specifically looked at fear of death together with discrimination against older people and found that there's a positive correlation. This is called terror management theory, which is the idea that as humans become aware of their own mortality, they try to avoid any anxiety associated with it, which is a problem when we're trying to work out how we are supposed to age ourselves. By the way, how old is an old person? I think most of you would be thinking probably 65. Uh, does anyone know where that's coming from? So like all good things, it came from the Germans. Uh, so Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, in response to growing left-wing sentiment inside his country, introduced the world's first national pension system. He originally put it at 70, parliaments reduced it down towards 65, and the concept stuck. This was the world's first retirement age, introduced in 1889, when the life expectancy was approximately 39. So the idea, a pension that no one could actually survive to. Uh, so going by math, if you want to update the pension, uh, so 1889 uh, divided by three, um, so your retirement age is supposed to be 137. Uh, so how do we grow old? Elaine Cumming was a famous uh, sociologist in 1961, and she came up with the idea of something called disengagement, which was the idea that people progressively turn inwards and withdraw from society for the benefit of the individual and society. So understandably, everyone hated this. The thing is that she didn't come up with it herself. She did so after studies of several hundred adults from middle to old age as part of something called the Kansas City Study of Adult Life. And it was Robert Havighurst in 1963 who proposed something called the activity theory, which is the idea that maintaining activity patterns and values typical of middle age was associated with a rich and satisfying life. And that's where we get the today's ideas of things like healthy aging. Now, healthy aging is a good thing. It's aspirational. It's a positive thing that we want to try to work towards. The problem is that it's not evidence-based. What is evidence-based is people who struggle with these unrealistic expectations of of, uh, of uh, being able to do incredible things and become despondent that they're not able to do this themselves. We also are living a lot longer. In the 1960s, average life expectancy was 69. Today's average life expectancy is about 82. That means that everyone, the vast majority of people over the age of 60 are living to an age beyond when their parents survived. They're effectively living without a map. And for the average 60-year-old, there's still at least another 30 years of life after that. So what are you supposed to do as you get older? The Harvard Aging Study uh, came up with a possible solution. So they've looked at over 700 individuals over, I think it's about 70 years now, I think, and counting. And they, they looked specifically at happiness. So what were the things that people did which was associated with happiness? And they found that the happiest seniors were those who found a way to transfer their wisdom to the next generation, anyone who passes knowledge on to the next generation was generally happier. If we go back towards looking at religious perspectives on this, I'll have a brief quote from the laws of Manu from uh, the Hindu text, which talks about uh, as the person old, gets older and sees their skin wrinkled, their hair white, let them always be industrious in reciting the religious texts, in summer expose themselves to the heat of the fires, and in the winter be dressed into, into wet clothes, experiencing the rigor of austerities, wandering alone, always without any companion, to attain final liberation. Now, the cynic in me makes this sound to me like an extremely efficient means of age care. It's uh, like, all right, granddad, it's, you know, it's time to be one with the elements, off to the forest, you, you know. Um, but the thing is that that's not the thrust of it. It's about a spiritual model of successful aging, which is to embrace your physical losses as an opportunity for spiritual gain. Which brings to the last research I talked about, which is Lars Tonstrom's gerotranscendence. So following research on palliative patients, he noted a pattern in transitions of behavior 
amongst people as they were approaching the final stages of life. He conducted interviews of attendees, did a public lecture, and after a subsequent set of research covering more than 4,000 people, developed this model called Gero Transcendence. It's a very complicated set of behaviors that occur that starts out with a cosmic dimension, with changes in how people perceive time, connections to earlier generations, contemplation of life and death, accepting the mysteries of life and transcendental sources of happiness, with the first stage being disengagement. Now, this sounds kind of religious, and it actually has very similar connections to the Christian text and to Hindu text. Here's the interesting thing. He studied this in terms of whether it was correlated with religious position, and it was not. It is the first known independent assessment that has something qualitatively different about aging that is associated with a change in how we see ourselves as well as the universe. There's a detachment from material wealth. There is a change in the way we actually think, which is very fascinating. So to close, the questions we must ask ourselves is, if we want to be happy, how are we going to do that? How are we preparing ourselves for what's going to come? And is it about being happy? Is it about physical identity? Is it about spiritual identity? Because if we don't ask ourselves these questions, they will be answered for us. Because it's our responsibility to pass our knowledge on to the next generation, our wisdom, and our failures. And as we reach the end, we have to somehow embrace the universe as it embraces us. We must break our programming and embrace our mortality. Only then will we take life as it should. That is, one has to learn how to grow old and try not to die. Thank you. I'd now like to invite Dr. Ruth Wilson, the author of The Jane Austen Remedy, which is the outcome of extensive reflection and a PhD completed at age 88. A pioneer of intergenerational projects in schools, she believes it is a truth universally acknowledged that a book can change a life, which sounds somewhat familiar, come to think of it. Uh, sense and sensibility, I think. Um, she speaks on aging and how to do it well. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for the introduction, Neil. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to acknowledge again the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and to express my pleasure in being here today. Is it not astonishing to hear that it is neither foolish nor uninformed to anticipate or at least speculate that in time we humans might live well, longer, feel well, even beyond the symbolic age of 120? And yet, here's the thing. I am equally astonished by the fact that at 90 years of age, I continue not only to feel well, but even to feel that I am thriving. And I am not alone. You have probably noticed people of my age everywhere. We attend concerts to listen to music. We visit art galleries to examine paintings. If we are talented like Patricia, we even create our own works of art. We eat and drink in restaurants and we load our trolleys from the shelves of the supermarkets. Some of us are less mobile than others. We stoop or use walking sticks or walking frames. But we nonogenarians are here, there and everywhere. We are, it seems, not over the hill. By contrast, my parents' generation bought thousands of copies of a self-help book that was published in 1932. It comforted them that they were not over the hill at 40. In the way that new ideas often do, the title of the book entered the public consciousness via a song. Life 
begins at 40. In your 20s and 30s, the song goes, you are just an amateur. When you reach 40, that's when you become a connoisseur. My father, who died when he was 65, loved the song and he loved the message that life would actually improve as he got older. Many men did. For women, it might have been more problematic. Life might begin at 40, one female reader wrote, but so do rheumatism, fallen arches, and the habit of telling the same stories many times over to the same bored listeners. Hereby, of course, hangs another tale, and I think it might be one about gender rather than age. I can sense a similar hashtag moment in current attitudes to longevity. It is the good life we value at any age rather than the long life at any cost. And I'm here today to share with you a story of how in this era of improved health care and better living conditions, my life began to flourish in 2016 when I was in my mid-80s and returned to the University of Sydney from which I had graduated almost half a century earlier. Taking a step back, I had experienced a transition at the age of 40. That was when I returned to work as my children grew older and I spent the following 20 years doing the things that busy women do, juggling family, work and social activities. Then, as I approached my 60s, an unexpected melancholy seemed to settle over my life. I suppose I sensed the passing of what is called the use-by date, as I lost my hearing and experienced physical symptoms that interfered with every activity of my day-to-day -day life. What to do? First, perforce, I retreated from my working life, my volunteer activities and my roles in organisations. Then I had counselling. I was told that the medical condition I was experiencing sometimes mimics depression. I've always loved reading fiction, so to distract myself from my increasingly perplexed state of mind, I decided to read the novels I had long neglected for want of time. And most important, as it turned out, I also decided to reread Jane Austen's novels because over the decades, I had always found time to return to their light, bright and sparkling world of dances, picnics and romance. As I immersed myself in their fictional universe, I was distracted from my negative feelings. And before long, I was experiencing sheer pleasure as I caught up with new books and reread old favourites. I felt that I was meeting uncannily familiar human beings in the complex fictional characters that came to life in the pages. And my understanding of the profundity of Jane Austen's shrewd observations of society increased during robust discussions about her characters, as well as her language, style, themes and plots with my new reading friends. One of the reasons for this sense of regeneration, and I think the good professors might agree with this, is that the neural machinery in our brains operates best when we undertake activities that connect us socially and intellectually to the world in which we live. In my case, reactivating my brain by reading and rereading fiction gave me, in my 80s, a renewed appetite for life and what it has to offer in the here and now. I became more curious about how and why reading the stories of fictional lives 
had influenced my feelings, opinions, and beliefs about myself and society. I found myself wondering whether Jane Austen's fiction, so important to me, remained relevant if and how her novels might be read to be of value to young readers in the 21st century. The process on which I then embarked as I wrote a PhD dissertation with this focus opened my mind to a new world, a new understanding of how my own lived experience of reading had influenced my feelings, my thoughts, my conduct. My research initiated me into the realm of neuroscience. What it tells us about mind reading or theory of mind and how and even where the brain is activated as it picks and chooses among our memories of past experiences to construct personal meanings from the stories we read. I learned how pleasure and cognition overlap as literature plays in the brain. I marveled at the relatively recently recognized plasticity of the brain the astonishing levels of cortical activity generated by the act of reading. And I discovered speculation about the crucial role of receptors and mirror neurons. In this way, I not only learned how the brain works, my own brain was given a vigorous workout to boot. I went on to write a memoir that I called Jane Austen's Remedy, appropriately because that's what it proved to be. In that book, I have paid homage to my favorite novelist, Jane Austen, and I have celebrated the ways in which reading fiction has allowed me both to lose myself in times of stress and to find myself in moments of distress. The ways in which reading and rereading have nurtured me have given me a second chance to flourish. I had never expected to write either a dissertation or a personal memoir, and both experiences were life-changing. On a good day, I am still surprised to find that the way I feel at 90 doesn't seem so very different from my memories of the way I felt at 19. On a day when I am troubled by aches and pains, I riff on an amusing line spoken by Eliza Doolittle, the heroine of George Bernard Shaw's play Pygmalion, so that she might say of me, when the time comes, it was the rheumatics that done the old lady in. <laughs> and then to challenge Eliza, I riff again this time on the more celebrated opening sentence of Jane Austen's novel, Pride and Prejudice, and improvise so that the famous sentence reflects my own situation. It is a truth universally acknowledged that an older person in possession of a large library need not be in want of a good life. Thank you. While uh, Neil gets his autograph, uh, I am uh, going to uh, say how lovely it is to be here on Gadigal land, uh, how lovely it is to have an audience to hear our uh, very uh, interesting panel. I'm from Geelong in Victoria. I'm going to take a leaf out of Patricia's book and I'm going to invite you to come to my house for a cup of tea. Uh, Geelong is a beautiful place, but I would just have to flag early on that there is no Sydney in Geelong, so uh, you might be disappointed a little bit. Um, so I'm going to summarise essentially what we've covered today. Uh, so Perminda has talked us through the science of living to 150, and then perhaps fortunately or unfortunately dashed our hopes, explaining that it's not currently 
possible based on our own biology unless there's a technological hack or unless you're a sturgeon uh, or a, what was it, an immortal jellyfish, which I don't see any of them in the audience today. Patricia has shared with us her experience of living through multiple decades. Neil has encouraged us to let go of our fear, embrace mortality and learn how to grow old. And Ruth has demonstrated how powerful shifts in perception can be and what might be achieved in later life. So you might be thinking about what you're going to do from here. I don't know, you're probably just thinking that you might need to go and get something to eat, go to the toilet, get back to work or on with your day. I don't know, you're probably going through the to-do list. But you might also be thinking about taking up an arts class or enrolling in a PhD or writing a memoir or you might just be thinking about going and buying Ruth's book, The Jane Austen Remedy, available in many good bookstores. Or you might just be thinking about healthy ageing and those five pillars of healthy ageing. You don't have to do gross caloric restriction like a worm. Uh, you can just have a healthy diet, regular exercise, sleep, social connection and mental stimulation. But there's something else that we can do to change our experience of ageing and that is to change our attitudes. So it's probably not a shocking thing if I flag that some of society's attitudes towards getting older are a little bit on the negative side. Some people might even say that there's a bit of ageism, where ageism is those stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination that we have towards other people or even ourselves based on age. We can have young ageism towards younger people, it's quite prevalent, but I guess our main concern here is about ageism towards older people. It's very common in surveys around the world, one in two people have uh, negative attitudes towards older people. And in Australia, many older people report experiencing age-based discrimination. Like Ruth told us before, older people are everywhere, but so is ageism. It's very normalised. It's so normalised that we often tend not to see it. But if you start looking for it, like the older people Ruth mentioned at the supermarket, you will see ageism everywhere. It's in film and TV. If older people are there at all, they're often represented in a very negative way. It's in media descriptions of older people. It is in healthcare where older people may not be offered treatment that they could benefit from. It's in birthday cards. Uh, <laughs> birthday cards can often be very ageist. It's in jokes. It's in everyday language. When people say things like, aren't you a bit old for that? Ageism is harmful. In lab-based psychological studies, when older people are shown negative material about age, they tend to perform worse on tasks. People who have negative attitudes towards ageing tend to develop worse health over time and have a reduced life expectancy of up to seven years compared to people with positive attitudes towards ageing. Now, I know everything gets compared to smoking, but ageism is almost as bad for you as smoking. Um, I don't think that's like encouraging people to take up smoking, so just, just want to say that. Um, ageism can lead to social isolation, financial insecurity and reduced quality of life. Stories like Ruth's and Patricia's are really interesting to us because they go against our usual beliefs about what it is to be an older person. The most common stereotype of the older person is as someone who is warm but incompetent. Um, Stereotypes are uh, not always harmful. I guess there's a bit of a debate about that. But Neil talked before about terror management theory, about one of the theories of why ageism occurs. There's another theory when it comes to ageism called stereotype embodiment theory. It's by Becca Levy, if anyone wants to look it up. But the idea in this theory is that over the course of our lifetime, we're being exposed to these stereotypes, these beliefs about ageing and we are absorbing them and internalising them. So it starts from a very young age when we were reading books about wicked old witches, when we are watching television shows about cranky, feeble, stupid Grandpa Simpson. We are absorbing these ideas, uh, internalising them, and they eventually become our own beliefs. And if you believe that older people don't exercise, don't take preventative health measures, don't have sex and don't wear skinny jeans, when you become the age 
that is what you think to be an older person, it's very unlikely that you're going to do those things. I see this in my clinic. It's like Ruth described before, that she got to a certain age and she started retreating from life, and I see this too. It's like there's a little timer that is going on inside us all the time, and then at some stage something happens, so a person might look in the mirror and notice that they seem old, or they might have a significant birthday, I don't know, 90, 40, whatever it is, that they suddenly start to embody these stereotypes. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. People become what they think an older person is, and this in turn perpetuates the stereotype. Now, there are three things that have been proven to reduce ageism. So one is policies and laws that reduce age-based discrimination. The other two are education and intergenerational contact. And I feel like we've been doing a little bit of that today. So intergenerational contact is, uh, as opposed to the technological hacks that we might need to live to 150, it's very, very low tech. It is when older people and younger people spend time together. And the thing about education and intergenerational contact is that they help to dispel some of these myths, these negative ideas about ageing. So, uh, I guess our call to action to you, tying everything up from the panel together and linking this to the, uh, the themes of the Vivid Festival, is that we hope that you will go away and to continue to challenge your ideas and beliefs about and assumptions about ageing, about what it is to be or become an older person, about uh, dying and about how to grow old. So thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that, Lisa. I now invite uh, everyone to ask uh, questions of the panel. Uh, if you have a question, if you could raise your hand and we'll try to get a mic out to you. Terrific panel, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, I've got a medical question. Could, could someone with a science background on the panel talk about telomeres and about the renewal of telomeres and whether that is an important aspect of living well longer? And also, could either Patricia or Ruth comment on an experience they've had of ageism and how they've dealt with it? Thank you. <clears throat> Amanda, would you like to take that one? So uh, with telomeres, uh, so if you uh, look at, so you know the genetic material comes in chromosomes, packed chromosomes, which is in the nucleus of the cell. And if you look at, uh, these are uh, two actually parts of a chromosome. And if you look at the ends of these chromosomes, uh, there is a, a string of uh, nucleotides, which uh, is like uh, the end of a shoelace, really. Essentially, that's what uh, it basically keeps it intact. So every time the cell divides, because when a cell divides, the genetic material has to divide into two and go into each of the cells. And a copy is made, and it goes into two separate cells. So each time that hap happens, the telomere shortens by a little, really. And then there, are, there is a system in the body. Uh, there's a telomerase. There's an enzyme that kind of repairs this to some degree as well, really. But eventually, with multiple divisions, the telomere does go down gradually. And when it goes, it becomes very small. It's just like a shoelace, really. It comes apart and the shoelace splits up. It's, a, the, it's no longer able to maintain the integrity of the chromosome. And the, and the replication, further replication will not happen itself. So it is important in that sense. And there has been some suggestion that the length of the telomere uh, may be an indicator of your biological age. It's not as good as we talked about epigenetics or methylation of the chromosome. That's probably a better indicator of your biological age. But we do see that with aging, the telomere length goes down. And we see in centenarians, people like Patricia, actually, they're able to maintain their telomere length. And even their offspring, and they have two granddaughters, two granddaughters, they also are able to maintain their telomere length. The curve is more flat as opposed to going down in these people. And people have been trying to work on strategies to actually, can you enhance telomere length? It's not really been very practical so far, uh, but we know. And there are certain disorders, like depression, for example. We know that with depression, telomere length goes down as well. So a number of different factors that can actually reduce 
the, uh, affect the aging process. Um, Ruth or Patricia, would you like to um, comment on the question on ageism? I'm happy to answer that. Um, I'm, I have to say I'm a little bit of an exception to the rule about having experienced ageism. It was very interesting when Lisa was speaking, that was the first time, and it may be because I don't recognise it when I see it, all those movies we now see about cranky old men and cranky old women, and I was just thinking of one that I watched last night, which I think has just appeared on Netflix with Maggie Smith. She's a cranky old lady. How is she rehumanized by her contact with her grandson? And I have to tell you, one of my pleasures is that I received a text this morning to say that my grandson was coming from Newcastle today to be here with me. So I think the more contact we do have with younger people, and I mean, the question of elders and wisdom, I think, is also a vexed, a vexed one. Not everybody is, is wise. Not when they're young, not when they're middle-aged, <laughs> not when they're old. And I think there are some realities we need to understand. But I think the more we have intergenerational programs in our schools, the better off children would be, the more they would grow, grow up with a sense of civility and kindness and courtesy towards older people. Thanks for the question. And I, I might just add to that. Um, I agree with you very much that not every older person is wise. But one of the important things about an older person is that they have more experience. One of the best bits of advice that I once received early in my career was that you have something to learn from everyone you meet. And sometimes you learn what not to do. <laughs> uh, which I think is important. <laughs> Sorry, there's a question over there. Would you like to say anything about ageism? Mm, no, no, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, it's just a question for you, Dr. Neil. Um, I was interested in what you said about disengagement and how that can be like a positive thing. Um, and I guess I just have a question around how you balance disengagement with, with our egos and, you know, trying to do well, make money, achieve things. Are those two things compatible and how do we find a good balance? That is a really challenging question, but I'll clarify some things about disengagement first. One big issue with the disengagement theory was the question as to whether it was involuntary disengagement or voluntary disengagement. So that was one of the biggest criticism. It's an observational study only. What I wonder about is whether Cummings was accidentally discovering gerotranscendence early because we know that the process of increased reflection and thinking back over a person's life starts with a level of disengagement. But the other part, is whether or not that process is something that necessarily must happen in later age or something that happens when you're younger. And that's a really hard question. Uh, Tonstrom was certain that it only happens at much later areas of life. His most vocal critic, uh, Rick, uh, a couple of years ago, published a number of articles asserting that uh, transcendence can happen at any age. Uh, the problem is that there actually is very little evidence for that. So the broader question, I suppose, is that if we are trying to work towards happiness, what are we looking for? And there are some things that we can get from that. One of them is how focused are we on material wealth? Um, what are the sources of happiness and what do they actually mean? Uh, there is, however, one of the best observational studies that we've recently come through. I don't know if any of you heard of the COVID pandemic. Um, <laughs> uh, that, and over that time, what was discovered, and there's amazing research coming out of that, was that we were all forced into our homes for a period of disengagement for almost a year on varying bases. It was a real life world experience that meant that over that time, everyone already had an opportunity for disengagement and reflecting on what actually mattered and what actually meant anything to us. Fast cars didn't figure very highly so far, but everyone who I've spoken to and interviewed about this had very similar things in terms of connections with family, meaningful social relationships, and a sense of a greater purpose. So uh, I hope that answers part of your question. Any other, uh, any other questions for our panel, please? Yeah. Thank you. I think mine is a sort of general question. One of the reasons I came today was in part of the promotion. It said something about 
how aging now can feel like a competition. And personally, I feel more pressure on me now, and I'm 68, so I don't really regard myself as being in the, uh, the same age as these wonderful women <laughs> we've heard talk today. And I, ju I, I just wondered whether people f feel a similar thing. The pressure to exercise, people who are obsessed with getting their 10,000 steps up a day or whatever it is, that I, I actually experience a bit of shame if I'm not doing that. I experience a bit of shame if I suddenly decide to have egg and chips for dinner. And I, I just wondered if other people felt like that. And I was very uh, reassured to hear your slight um, bump in the road in your 60s, I think you said. Because um, I, personally, I, I don't really regard myself as old, but I do find myself retreating more and and somehow not having the energy to deal with certain things so that yes that's my question just wondering whether people generally feel this pressure would anyone have a response to that i'm gonna start by saying that you don't have to feel shame um uh but the way that you feel is really very normal, that a lot of people feel the way that you feel at any age. I think that everyone feels pressure to be doing certain things. Um, so that's the first thing to say. I guess, I don't know, and Neil might be able to comment on this as well, but that's kind of like the, <laughs> I guess, the downside of having this concept of healthy ageing or encouraging people to take steps to kind of optimise their health and wellbeing as they get older is that, firstly, not everyone can do all those things that we're encouraging them to do. Uh, not everyone can have a healthy diet or exercise regularly. A lot of people have difficulty sleeping. A lot of people experience loneliness and can't make social connections. Uh, and not everyone has opportunities for, you know, meaningful mental stimulation. So these things are not accessible to everybody. Uh, and the other thing is that sometimes people might do all of those things, but they'll still experience ill health and disability uh, and the, I guess, the uh, unpleasant things that can happen to people as they get older. In 2013, the... Um, <coughs> uh, the um, uh, the Human Rights Commission, uh, the Human Rights Commission, and the Disability and Aging Commissioner in uh, Sydney uh, commissioned a study looking at how people defined age, and they had focus groups of people who are under fifty years old and over fifty years old. Under fifty years old, almost without exception, everyone defined old as being of age sixty-five and older. Over the age of fifty people had a huge range of answers, and it was generally about some sort of socioeconomic uh, position that they had not yet reached. With, with, uh, when I'm admitted to a nursing home, that's when I'm old. When I'm no longer able to go outside or to drive, that's when I've grown old. And it's this constant idea about the problem of now I'm old, I'm past it with that fatalistic idea, rather than recognizing, as uh, Professor Sachdev was talking about, that it is part of an ongoing process, that we are always aging. Um, the, uh, uh, even, even my 10-year-old in the audience is currently aging. We are all, because aging is just living, there is always a process of change, which is about um, some things getting better and some things getting worse. The problem is, and what you just described, I'm very grateful for that comment because it's got an excellent evidence base. We know that there is research that uh, people feel pressured by images of healthy aging. And if there's one thing I've known for certain, it's that there is no way, no single way to grow old. Uh, what I'm fascinated about is all the interesting changes that happen to the mind and to our psyche as we do grow older. And I really wonder what kind of a person I might be at 90, which comes back to what Dr. Wilson was saying, that she found a completely new identity just in the last 10 years of her life. 
Would you like to comment? Yes, I would like to add something. Um, I think possibly the most fulfilling thing I have done in my life, apart from having children and bringing up a family, of course, was the writing of a memoir. And of course it helps if you have a publisher, that gives you the motivation. <laughs> and It is a tremendous... But if you have the willpower, I really believe what we all crave at every stage of our life is some form of affirmation. Maybe by the time we get to our 60s, we're not getting that affirmation anymore. We're not in that active stage of life where we're getting, uh, where we're being bolstered by other people's good opinions. I found in writing the memoir that what I actually achieved was self-affirmation, and that was even more important than the affirmation itself. The fact that I could go back and think about all the things I had done, even the things that weren't so pleasant to remember, but think about them again and ponder on your life and ponder how you might have done. It sounds like a very interior thing, and I happen to like the interior life. I think it helps. But I really think maybe just write it all down. And there are memoirs pouring off the publishers out of the, on the press today. Everyone is liking to read them because I don't think you're on your own. Everybody is feeling the need to understand how other people, as they grow older and as they, as they face challenges, how they're actually dealing with them. We have time for one more question. <laughs> Two questions, yeah. Look, this is a, a, probably a philosophical question. So um, I, I just think that Western society, uh, we seem to be obsessed with two things, with material wealth and um, uh, uh, what's the other thing? Um, youth, youth, of course, youth. You know, it's everywhere. Um, that's why there's ageism and so on. It just seems to me, look, we've been, human beings have been around for a long while. There's been enormous changes in our Western society, not all for the good, you know. Uh, is it something to do with our fear of death that makes us want to not be old and not think about age and see it in such a negative light? Um, because are there, were there other times earlier in the human evolution when, you know, ageing was revered and looked to and people were more accepting somehow or other of, I don't know, whether it's death or what, but, you know, they were more accepting of older people and, and the wisdom of older people. So I don't know what my question is, but anyway. <laughs> but, well, I, I, think I, can, uh, I think I can also address one bit of that. There is only one society consistently which has seemed to have the idea of the older person having some sort of a role, and that is the Japanese, which is quite unusual that compared to everywhere else in Southeast Asia even, I mean, you do see more veneration of older people, but they don't have that position in society as being seen as ongoing sources of respect and inclusion in society that you see anywhere else in the world. And it actually has been reflected in some of the psychiatric statistics because we don't see the same sort of late life mood changes in Japanese older people that you would be seeing in virtually every other society. Um, so it's doable, and we also see the impact of that. And that's part of why we have an event like this, to think about what our social attitudes to aging are, as, uh, as uh, Lisa was speaking about, because if we are able to make those sorts of changes, it's going to lead towards something better for us. So I'd have to close it at that point. Um, I would, uh, first of all, like to thank uh, our speakers. We have a, a little token of uh, appreciation towards uh, Professor uh, Sachdev, uh, towards uh, Ms. Segal, Dr. Lisa Mitchell, and to Dr. Ruth Wilson. I would also like to thank our behind-the-scenes uh, volunteers, uh, Janelle Burns of Operations, uh, Angie Russell, uh, Fleur Harrison, and Rebecca Katz, and our amazing crew, Ange, uh, Andrew, Ibby, Stewart, and so wonderful much. producer. I was hoping they were for me. <laughs> Thank you. All right.
Thank you very much, everybody, for your attention. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience. And, uh, and we might close just to remember that if there's one take home from this, is that apart from the idea that we have to make these decisions or they could be made for us, the good thing is that there doesn't seem to be a single way to grow old. So, uh, uh, so I hope you all enjoyed your time together. Get home safe. Thanks very much. Thank you for joining us at the Vivid Ideas Exchange. Please exit through the lower doors located at the bottom left of the theatre. Thank you again for joining us. We hope to see you again.